Good afternoon, class. We begin with a short fable today, The Wolf and the Lamb. Sakha, could you read the first paragraph, please? Yes, The Wolf and the Lamb. One day, a lamb was eating sweet grass away from a flock of sheep. She didn't notice a wolf walking nearer to her. When she saw the wolf, she started pleading, Please, don't eat me. My stomach is full of grass. You can wait a while to make my meat taste much better. The grass in my stomach could be digested quickly. If you let me dance, the wolf agreed. Yes, thank you. And can you read the second one? Yeah. While the lamb was dancing, she had a new idea. She said, I can dance faster if you take my bell and ring it so hard. The wolf took the bell and started to ring so hard. The shepherd heard the sound and ran quickly to save the lamb's life. Okay, thank you. So what do you guys think of the moral of the story? Me? Uh, yes. Uh, from my point of view, the wolf is quite stupid. And in contrast, the lamb is very smart. Uh, after listening to these stories, I think we should use our intelligence under dangerous circumstances. I agree, thank you. Uh, who else have any other ideas? Me? Is that how it uh, I think the lamb is quite lucky uh, because uh, she is just uh, she's small and uh, she shouldn't have eaten away from her flock of sheep. Um, it's very dangerous. Yes, I see. Mm -hmm. yes. Exchange greetings in different culture. How can you read Dawn's part? Via Ami, I ride my bike through our community every morning. My neighbors and I exchange greetings on a regular basis. Once in a while, I would greet a neighbor with "Good morning," and the person will respond, "What's good about it?" I'll finally come up with a response. It's not a statement of fact. It's my wish for you. Invariably, this man will smile and a good wish for. Morning. It seems to make both of us feel better. Thank you. Uh, I can you read Annie's part? Yes. Dear Dom, thank you for the reminder that our days can turn around instantly with something as simple as a kind greeting and some well wishes. Thank you. So who here understands the hidden meaning of the story? Well, I hope that you guys can Go home and think really long and hard about the meaning behind this story and tell me in the next class. Okay class, now we're going to watch a short video on how tea time came to England. Nothing says Britain more than... Nope. Nope. Keep going. Ah oh, yes, there it is. A nice cup of tea. We know we have China to thank for introducing tea to the Western world, but how did it make its way to England and become the cultural obsession it is today? Well, that's all thanks to one Portuguese woman. The year, 1662. The person? Catherine of Braganza. She had just won the hand of England's King Charles II. With the help of a very large dowry, including money, treasures, and spices, this worthwhile trade made her the Queen of England, Scotland, and Ireland. When she arrived to her new homeland, she brought with her packets of loose leaf tea in crates labelled Transport de Ervas Aromaticas. It's a theory that this was later abbreviated to TEA. Tea. Now tea could already be found in England, but was only really used for medicinal purposes. Catherine continued drinking tea to her heart's content. Mm. And as the new royal, everything about her, including her beverage habits, was copied by other ladies, desperate to be just like their idol. Another thing Catherine brought to the table from Portugal was the idea of tea drinking experience. She popularized the use of porcelain teacups and mugs. By the end of the 17th century, much of British aristocracy were enjoying the hot beverage. Ooh, delightful. And soon enough, so was everyone else. Today, while tea can be found pretty much everywhere, it remains a special daily pastime for the Brits. Mm. So carry on and drink tea, people of England. So, does everyone understand the meaning of this story? What do you think about it? Um, 
after watching about the story of the women, uh, I have just found that they take the tea with milk and sugar. Yes. And I think it looks delicious. Mm -hmm. and, and I will try to do it. Thank you. Uh, who else have any other ideas? Well, um, I will write tea. Um, I think it's a great start for me with a cup of tea and to boost my mood in the day. Especially if you have it in the morning, right? Thank you. Uh, I have some comments too. Uh, go ahead. Yes, I think the culture is kind of great. They drink teas with uh, ceramics things, I think. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's beautiful and it's such a nice mix. And uh, I think uh, they just they just spread this culture to our country too. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's why milk tea is so popularized here. Yeah. Thank you all. So now we're going to do a grammar exercise on the topic traveling. The first one, in my country, people never leave tips. So when I first went abroad, I kept forgetting to tip waiters. I felt really embarrassed. Number two, the first time I traveled abroad, who can complete the sentence? Pao. Mm -hmm. I felt really depressed. I was alone and I didn't speak the language and I didn't make any friends. Very good, thank you. Number three, I just spent a year in France learning to speak French. It was a satisfying experience and I was... Who can do this one? Uh, and I was fascinated by the culture. Very good, thank you. Number four, at first, I really didn't like shopping in the open air markets. I felt, hang, would you? Um, I think I felt uncomfortable because so many people were trying to sell me something at the same time. Yes, thank you. And last one, number five, when I arrived in Lisbon, I was nervous because I couldn't speak any Portuguese. As I began to learn the language, though, I became more how? I became more confident about living there. Okay, thank you. Slang abroad. Now we're going to read the following article to get an idea on the differences between American English and British English. Uh, that how can you please read the first paragraph? Okay. Um, George Bernard Shaw said, England and America are two countries separated by a common language. I never really understood the meaning of this quote until a friend and I stopped in the London convenience store. We had some trash to throw away, so I, in as polite a manner as I could muster, asked the clerk for a trash can. Then I asked him again, thinking he didn't hear me. And then I asked again, only this time, while speaking the international language, loudly and slowly while pointing to the object I wanted to throw away. After this horribly rude display, he politely asked me what a trash can was. So I told him it was a place for my garbage. I guess this weak explanation worked. The clerk then produced a small trash can from behind the counter, and in the most you must not be from around here tone, he could muster say, rubbish bin. Okay, thank you. Uh, and could you continue with the second paragraph? Different names for objects, however, is not the main problem. Anyone can learn a language, but to really be a speaker of the language, you need to understand its idioms and its language. There is a distinct difference between someone who learned a language in a classroom and someone who is a native speaker. Using slang proves that the speaker has been in a country long enough to learn it, and that offers a benefit greater than just being able to converts on a casual level. It allows the two speakers 
to get much closer, much more quickly. Thank you, Pat. The third one. Eventually, after living somewhere for a while, you pick up a few things. And this new language education gives a credibility that just pronouncing a city address can help. It shows a belonging and membership in the club of permanent residents, and that one is not just a mere extended tourist. I know it sounds superficial, that by being able to understand words that may or may not be in a dictionary, and can fool people into thinking we belong, but it isn't. What knowing and using slang shows is a basic understanding of a culture. It offers both members of the conversation a common ground. And thus the point, Britain and America are two countries separated by a common language, but then again so are Mexico and Spain, Brazil and Portugal, and France and Haiti. While these countries' languages may all seem the same on paper, they are not. Really, learning the languages can only be done on the ground. And once that learning is done, something far greater is achieved than just not sounding like a fool. Thank you. Have you ever heard of the word buskers? London underground stations offer a lot of different kinds of entertainment. And today we're going to read a short article on buskers. Zach, how can you read? The first paragraph. Thank yes. You. Buskers. London's underground stations can be places of entertainment, as well as places where you go for transport. When you get off the tube, you sometimes have to walk a long way to the exit or the chain trains. In this long passage way, if you're lucky, you may see a busker. A busker play or sing anywhere you can find listeners. In the underground, in the street, outside the cinemas, or at the bus stop, people throw money into his hat or his instrument case. Buskers are usually between 17 and 13 years of age. Some of them play classical music, some play pop, and some play folk. Many buskers are ex-university students or graduates from music academies. Andrew Hain used to be a music student, but he gave up music to become a painter. Now he plays in the underground because he doesn't want to forget how to play. His girlfriend Georgina, she's a painter too, helps him to collect the money. And can you read the next paragraph, please? Yes. Um, another basker, David McNew, says he has been basking for years and gives this advice to the beginners. A heavy type of beat attracts the people and it's best to keep a broad topical repertoire. Learn new songs all the time or the listener will get tired of you. Wear colorful clothes. Wear colorful clothes to attract people's attention. But you must remember not to look very rich. The places where you choose to play must be fairly warm. The best places are bridges or uh, tunnels of subways. Thank you. Uh, Pao, can you continue with the last two paragraphs? Yes. The weather is one of the unpleasant aspects of basking. It's no joke playing the new turn where November day in London and trying to survive for gliding. But worse of all is the police. By law, they must move anyone on who is causing an obstruction. Many of the London policemen are very fair about the buskers. One constable said, If the music's full and the mind is all part of London, isn't it? The maximum fine which buskers are to pay is $20. Although most buskers get away with paying only 2 or $3. However, most buskers will say that this is a small price to pay compared with the pleasant and freedom of their way of life. Most tired, busy Londoners who are segregated on their way home will agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have two questions for you guys. The first one is, 
why can London's underground stations be places of entertainment? And the second one, where do buskers usually play? Who here have the answers? I have the answers for the first questions. Um, I think for many tourists in London, however, subway musicians are local color. So what can be a frustrating attempt to navigate the city's public transit system? And uh, for London people, a live tune can make their stuffy commute a little more pleasant? Yes, thank you. I can you answer the second question. Um, I think buskers can play or sing anywhere they can find listeners, in the underground, in the street, outside cinemas, or at bus stops. Thank you. Let's move on to the next part of our lesson, idiomatic expressions. The general grammar structure of idiomatic expressions is verb plus noun phrase plus preposition. Some common expressions include catch sight of, feel pity for, or take or have pity on, give birth to, keep track of, lose track of, lose sight of, make a contribution to, make use of, take note of, here we have a few examples, take pity on, Finally, I took pity on your tired servant and told him to go to bed as he let me out. Keep track of. It is the manager's job to keep track of what's going on in that store and make sure that all the work is getting done on a consistent basis. Pay attention to. You need to pay more attention to the teacher. Take advantage of. Many adults have also taken advantage of the rise in computer ownership and internet access to further their informal education. Now, can each of you give me one example using these expressions? Uh, Kao, can you go first? Um, Mary is often absent from class. She can keep playing with her classmates. Okay, thank you. And can you continue? Yes, um, she's, she's very furious that she's being made fun of. Thank you. Um, the house has been remodeled and made use of. Thank you. Tao, can you give me another example? Can you take care of my dogs while I'm holiday? Thank you. And? Um, he left home without taking leave of anybody. Um, this shop is so small that we didn't take notice of it. Alright, good job guys. Uh, and teacher? Yes. Uh, I came across a sign like don't look a key holes in the mouth and I didn't understand it. Can you give me the definition of it? Great. Okay, so Idioms or idiomatic expressions are groups of words with an established meaning unrelated to the meanings of the individual words. Sometimes called an expression, an idiom can be very colorful and make a picture in our minds. Here we have a few examples like easy come, easy go. No pain, no gain. Out of sight, out of mind. Travel broadens the mind. Now, let us use AMD to figure out the meaning of that expression we just asked. We'll try to use the application AMD to search up the meaning of the expression don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Firstly, let's look up the word horse.
to put the cart before the horse, meaning đặt con trâu trước cái cẩy, cầm đèn chạy trước ô tô. To swap or change horses while crossing the stream. To swap or change horses in midstream. Là thay ngựa giữa dòng. You can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Bạn có thể tạo cơ hội tốt cho người ta, nhưng họ vẫn có thể bỏ cơ hội ấy. To lock the stable door after the horse has bolted. Mất châu mới lo làm chuồng. To look a gift horse in the mouth. Từ chối hoặc bài bác của biếu không. Secondly, let's look up the word look. Look a gift horse in the mouth. To be critical or suspicious of something one has received without expense. From the practice of judging a horse's age by its teeth. Có nghĩa là chê bai, nghi ngờ, một quà tặng. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Đừng chê bai hoặc từ chối những gì mà người khác biếu tặng cho mình, cho dù nó không được hoàn hảo. The shoes my sister gave me were a little too tight, but I never look a gift horse in the mouth. Đôi giày chị tôi cho hơi chật, nhưng tôi không bao giờ chê bai những gì là quà tặng. They did not look the gift horse in the mouth when the opportunity for victory presented itself. I noticed the guitar wasn't made of real wood, but I didn't say anything because you shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. You should accept the Nokia mobile phone as a 16th birthday present from your parents delightedly. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Finally, can anyone translate the idiom ngựa non hào đá into English? Next is a reading and comprehension task on traveling. The way we work, impressions of Southern Europe. Extracts from memoirs and diaries. Is that how can you read the first text? In 1776, Samuel Johnson is recorded by James Boswell as observing a man who has not been in Italy is always conscious of an inferiorities from his not having seen what is expected a man should see. The grand object of traveling is to see the shores of the Mediterranean. On those shores were the four great empires of the world, the Assyrians, the Persians, the Grecians, and the Roman. All our religions, almost all our law, almost all our arts, almost all that set us above savage, has come to us from the shores of the Mediterranean. Thank you. Hi, can you continue with the next text? Yes. Uh, Julia could write, a British uh, historian of the Renaissance travels to Southern Europe for the first time in 1876, aged 24. We reach Avignon by the afternoon and a delicious change in climate and surroundings met up at the station. We walked up the long course beach where the natives were walking about chattering in the volleyball who sensor and in the true Italian fashion came running up to us to beg. This was indeed the South Plain Tortoise Street, a perfect labyrinth of leaf faced women at work in high windows men singing as they move lazily along, children running after us and old women begging at the church doors. 
Here too, the spring burst upon us in old sweet scents of relay. It may matter as we walk later on up to the place when we found following struck or in blossom. Castier, tall, Portugal, laurel, white and red lilac, a Spanish, chestnuts and blue Irish, forget me nots and wall flowers and roses filling the air with fragrance. I seldom found love with a place so entirely at one side. Thank you, Ta. Can you read the last text, please? Zi mm -hmm. Befford, the German born British novelist and journalist travels to Italy in 1961. If one were wafted from our shores onto the vine or we near the off-spay dieting, our first shock of pleasure might be the cypresses and fig tree, the pink and blue wash houses, the basin sea. When the transition is by motoring in from French, the first shock is the mad driving. It is the driving that scares the French. Each time one finds that this has become more impossible. It is not that Italian driving does get worse. It stays the same and they drive very well, extremely well, too well. Every man boy drive for them. It is that each year there are more cars to drive. Italian motoring is like the nationalism of a very young nation, but there is more to it than that. There is also a natural affinity. The automobile must be God's special gift to the Italians. He even created his noisy. Thank you. <laughs> Anima ghiacci, dolorata, non si dà pace, ma chi ma la nuttata, lo tempo passa, ma non a giorno, non c'è mai soli. Yes, I do. I'm keen on writing my hard rules, and there's nothing that has to do with more than comprehensively than traveling. Thank you, Zeta. Uh, and what kind of places have you visited in your life? Sadly, I didn't get to see many destinations inside and outside of my native country. I had traveled a bit in the south of Russia and went to see parts of Switzerland, Italy, France, Ukraine, Serbia, Belarus, and Germany. Thank you. Cal, uh, which place would you really like to visit and why? Mm, I had first thought about this when I was in middle school, much before I first left Russia. I remember seeing Machu Picchu in one of our books about Machu and falling in love with it. See then, I have always wanted to go to Peru and this old in Sydney. Zeta, what's the best place you've ever visited? The city that has really astonished me with its beautiful architecture and history was Paris. It is not only the capital of culture, economics, and education, but also the place full of vivid art and romance. Thank you. Hi, how do you prefer to travel on long journeys? Uh, when it takes a lot of time to get to a destination, I definitely prefer to travel by a sleeping train. These are trains with comfortable beds where it is possible to relax and recharge before reaching new places. Describe an interesting journey you have been on. You should say where you went, how you traveled there, who you went with, and say how it affected your life at the time. Is that how do you mind if we start with you? Now start with uh, 
One of my favorite trip is the one I did in March to Paris. What is the peculiar things about me? I don't like traveling without a clear purpose. I would rather to go a conference abroad than just fly to another country with no purpose other than wandering street. So they did exactly what happened on my journey to France. I was invited to attend a three-day workshop in corporate mergers and acquisitions with BCG. That stands for Boston Consulting Group. The hosting company paid all my expenses, including a round flight to Paris. However, I had a hard time receiving a visa, so I have to reschedule in total in teenage races. After I finally landed in the French capital, a transfer driver picked me up and drove to a jetos, which turned out to be a beautiful countryside hotel set up in an old mansion. There was not only me, but also 50 other young people, students from the best European universities. The acceptance rate to this annual event is only 4%. So I felt very privileged to be there. I've not only made friends from all over the world, but also solved a real life business case where we had to follow and sell a company, presenting a strategy to the management board afterward. And the best final part of the event was a sightseeing trip around Paris, where I admired the Eiffel Tower the Notre Dame de Paris, and many other breathtaking cathedral and places that France is so famous for. Mark Twain, pseudonym of Samuel Langhorn Clements, American humorist, journalist, lecturer, and novelist who acquired international fame for his travel narratives, especially The Innocents Abroad, Roughing It and life on the Mississippi, and for his adventure stories of boyhood, especially the adventures of Tom Sawyer and adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I'll read to you the following anecdote. Once Mark Twain's friends in San Francisco asked him to deliver a lecture on the interesting things he had seen in the Hawaiian Islands, the author had never delivered a lecture before and the very idea of speaking to a large audience frightened him. However, he agreed at last when his friends promised him to place themselves among the audience to laugh often as well as loudly during his lecture. When Mark Twain came out on the platform, his knees were shaking so much, he looked so frightened that his friends thought he wouldn't be able to say a word. But the lecturer needed no help from his friends. After all, he won the day by his unusual opening. Julius Caesar is dead. Shakespeare is dead. Napoleon is dead. Abraham Lincoln is dead. And I am far from well myself. When the lecture was over, the audience had been laughing so much that they were too weak to leave their seats. Now we're going to read an excerpt from a book by Mark Twain. Hi, can you read the first paragraph? Yes. From Baden Baden, we made the customary trip into the Black Forest. We were on foot most of the time. One cannot describe those noble woods, nor the feeling with which they inspire. A feature of the feeling, however, is a deep sense of contentment. Another feature of it is a bonnet, boyish gladness, and a third and very conspicuous feature of it is one sense of the remoteness of the workday world and his entire emancipation yep. from it and its affairs. Those whose dress are broken over a vast region, and everywhere they are such these dense woods, and so still, and so pink, and fragrant. The stems of the trees are trimmed, 
a street, and in many places all the ground is hidden for miles under a thick cushion of a moss of a vivid green color, with not a decay of wretched spot in its surface, and not a fallen life or trick to mark his immaculate tidings, a rich cathedral room perfects the pillar ever so the stray flags of the sunlight that try a charm here and above yonder are strongly ascended. And when they strike the most they fairly seem to burn. But the greatest effort the and the most enchanting that is that produced by the diffused light of the low afternoon sun. No single ray is able to pierce its way in, but the diffused light takes color from moss and foliage and pervades the place like a faint green tide mist, the theatrical fire in fairyland, the suggestion of mystery and the supernatural which haunts the forest at all times is intensified by this unearthly love. The trap abroad my dream. Thank you. So who here is a fan of the Beatles? Today we're going to read through the school report of the Beatles vocalist John Lennon. So now can you start? We're digging into the far magazine vault to bring you the school report of a young and rebellious teen, one who would make his name with the Beatles and change the face of music, John Lennon, where there are a few indicators as to whether an individual is intelligent or not. We can all be assured that the school report is certainly not one of them. As many a successful author would tell you, their attitude in life was often not recognized in school, in many official capacity at least, and the same can be said for John Winston Lennon. Born in Liverpool to a working class family, what Lennon lacked in attitude he made up for in inherent intelligence and was able, as many musical great are, to coast through school without truly exerting himself. In his school report, it's easy to see that. Thank you. I need to read the school report, please. Yes. French teacher, an intelligent boy who could be very much better with a little concentration in class. Math teacher, is certainly on the road to failure if this goes on. Physics teachers, his work always lacks effort. He is content to drift instead of using his ability. Religion teacher. Attitude in class most unsatisfactory. Headmaster. He has too many wrong ambitions and his energy is too often misplaced. I found a very impressive speech by Steve Jobs that I would like to share with all of you. to be with you today for your commencement from one of the finest universities in the world. <sighs> Truth be told, uh, I never graduated from college, and uh, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a college graduation. <laughs> today, I want to tell you three stories from my life. That's it. No big deal. Just three stories. The first story... It's about connecting the dots. I dropped out of Reed College after the first six months, but then stayed around as a drop-in for another 18 months or so before I really quit. So why did I drop out? It started before I was born. My biological mother was a young, unwed graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates 
So everything was all set for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out, they decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, who were on a waiting list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, we've got an unexpected baby boy. Do you want him? They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. And 17 years later, I did go to college. But I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. After six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. The minute I dropped out, I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. I didn't have a dorm room, so I slept on the floor in friends' rooms. I returned Coke bottles for the five-cent deposits to buy food with. And I would walk the seven miles across town every Sunday night to get one good meal a week at the Hare Krishna temple. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me. And we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that calligraphy class, and personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. My second story is about love and loss. I was lucky. I found what I loved to do early in life. Waz and I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard, and in 10 years, Apple had grown from just the two of us in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I just turned 30. And then I got fired. How can you get fired from a company you started? Well. As Apple grew, we hired someone who I thought was very talented to run the company with me. And for the first year or so, things went well. But then our visions of the future began to diverge, and eventually we had a falling out. When we did, our board of directors sided with him. And so at 30, I was out, and very publicly out. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, 
and it was devastating. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. I felt that I had let the previous generation of entrepreneurs down, that I had dropped the baton as it was being passed to me. I met with David Packard and Bob Noyce and tried to apologize for screwing up so badly. I was a very public failure and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. The turn of events at Apple had not changed that one bit. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love. And so I decided to start over. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pixar, and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. Pixar went on to create the world's first computer animated feature film, Toy Story, and is now the most successful animation studio in the world. In a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next, and I returned to Apple, and the technology we developed at Next is at the heart of Apple's current renaissance. And Lorreen and I have a wonderful family together. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometime life, sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. And that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking. Don't settle. My third story is about death. When I was 17, I read a quote that went something like, if you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. It made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. About a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had a scan at 7.30 in the morning, and it clearly showed a tumor on my pancreas. I didn't even know what a pancreas was. The doctors told me this was almost certainly a type of cancer that is incurable, and that I should expect to live no longer than three to six months. My doctor advised me to go home and get my affairs in order, which is doctor's code for prepare to die. It means to try and tell your kids everything. You thought you'd have the next 10 years to tell them in just a few months. It means to make sure everything is buttoned up so that it will be as easy as possible for your family. It means to say your goodbyes. I live with that diagnosis all day. Later that evening, I had a biopsy where they stuck an endoscope down my throat, through my stomach and into my intestines put a needle into my pancreas and got a few cells from the tumor. I was sedated, but my wife, who was there, told me that when they viewed the cells under a microscope, the doctor started crying because it turned out to be a very rare form of pancreatic cancer that is curable with surgery. I had the surgery, and thankfully, I'm fine now.
This was the closest I've been to facing death, and I hope it's the closest I get for a few more decades. Having lived through it, I can now say this to you with a bit more certainty than when death was a useful but purely intellectual concept. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you. But someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. Sorry to be so dramatic, but it's quite true. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. When I was young, there was an amazing publication called the Whole Earth Catalog, which was one of the Bibles of my generation. It was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park, and he brought it to life with his poetic touch. This was in the late 60s, before personal computers and desktop publishing, so it was all made with typewriters, scissors, and Polaroid cameras. It was sort of like Google in paperback form 35 years before Google came along. It was idealistic, overflowing with neat tools and great notions. Stuart and his team put out several issues of the Whole Earth Catalog, and then, when it had run its course, they put out a final issue. It was the mid-1970s, and I was your age. On the back cover of their final issue was a photograph of an early morning country road, the kind you might find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. It was their farewell message as they signed off, stay hungry, stay foolish. And I have always wished that for myself. And now, as you graduate to begin anew, I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all very much.